The reading today is found in 1 John and chapters 3 and 4. Um, if you're following along, bear with me as we're going to jump about a, a little bit, so hopefully I, I don't miss anything here, Dan. But first, first John chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then in chapter 4, starting in verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Amen. We're in the fourth week of this series in First John, this Rest Assured series. And Stuart mentioned at the beginning of the series that John is written, is written in an interesting style, I think, how Stuart put it was, it's all over the map. There's repetition of important points. Um, some people suggest it might have like a cyclical or a, a spiral structure. It's not what we're used to, okay? Um, and it means we're jumping about a bit between these little verses today, these little short sections. But I hope you'll stick with me. And I hope that you'll see the clear themes that we're working through. And that we're not just cherry picking the verses that we want out of this. Again, as was mentioned the other week, what's been missed should be caught up with and covered later. This week our title is Rest Assured in the Father's Love for Us as His Children. And it's, it's impossible to miss the theme of God's love in these passages. Um, and twice in these verses we read some of the most infamous words in the whole of the Bible. Those three words, God is love. Now those words have become a bit controversial, a bit of a controversial thing to say um, these days, haven't they? In a number of ways, really, whether it's from debating whether God could possibly be loving and condemn people to hell, um, or thinking about the phrase love wins and what that should mean, or arguing over whether God being love means he approves of our lives unconditionally, or even what a rainbow represents, and everything else in between. And all of this kind of misses the point slightly. I'm not going to be speaking directly to any of these, but I think it helps to think of this um, so that we understand that this issue is endemic of the fact that our world has a different idea of love than to what we find in God's Word. The world's idea of love is weaker. It's sorely lacking compared to what we find in God's word. So while, we're not, while I'm not directly going to make that the point of this morning, I do hope that as we work through these words from John today, we'll all develop a slightly clearer idea of the biblical model of love and therefore what it means for the Father to love us. So, thinking about these verses, we'll consider this assurance that we have in three parts. First, we'll think about our present status, what it means to be loved and to be children of God, how we find assurance in this status. And then we'll think about our future hope, our confidence that we have, our image bearing and our inheritance. 
And then finally, we'll think about our current reality and responsibility, the now but not yet of this truth and how we work things out in the meantime. So, first up, what is our present status? 1 John 3 begins, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Dear friends, now we are children of God. So we are called children of God, and we are children of God. We have the name, and we have the status I remember back when I was about 14 or 15, I did a few days work experience at the big DuPont factory in the Northwest where my dad worked. Um, and he had been working there for many years, ever since he left school. They had sponsored him through university and he'd worked there right through. So even while I wasn't working in his department, people knew him. And they'd say, that's Fred Black's son. The name carried status in his workplace. And that kind of carried over to me a little bit. And that, was, that was nice for me. Partly because he had a good reputation in his workplace. But also because he was a good dad. I was proud of my dad. I still am, by the way. I've had a very good experience. A very good example of fatherhood. It's a joy to be a child in the black household. And my hope is that I'll pass that on to the next generation as well, that my kids will have that same experience. But I'm really aware that for many people, they don't have that good experience. And the idea of God as your father, of being in a family, of being somebody's child, might not be so positive for you. And if that's the case, then I hope that reading God's word this morning, you will be given a better picture a more beautiful design for what it means to be someone's beloved child or what it should mean. I hope that your experience of being part of church as well, of being part of this family of God, as broken and as faulty as we may be at times, I pray that your experience of that will hint at that perfect design, that more beautiful picture that God has for us. Because the father that we have is much better than anything that we could possibly imagine of a father, even for those of us who wouldn't want to change their dad. In Matthew 6 and 7, we have um, some words of Jesus in quick succession affirming the nature of God as our father and his goodness towards us. In chapter 6, we read, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And in chapter 7, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We sing about having a good, good father, don't we? And that's because we do, we have a good, good father. Our father is all powerful and all loving. And he delights in giving us good gifts. In Ephesians 1, Paul tells us, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Way before the world began, way before creation, God chose you. In love, he chose you. And it was his pleasure. This is the type of father, this type of loving father we have. We need to grasp that God's love is not just the kind of fuzzy feelings that movies will tell you about. It's not that he, he might choose to give us some nice things if, if we ask nicely. No, love is his nature. God is love. In chapter 4, verse 10, we read, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And on to verse 16. Know and rely on the love God has for us. When a man and a woman come together to get married, we offer each other vo voice. 
in the wedding ceremony. We pledge our love and our lives to each other, no matter what. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Dear love Sue, she only knows for poorer. In sickness and in health. We're promising to stick with it, to stick with each other through thick and thin, no matter what. The problem is, our nature is broken. And we change, and we don't feel the same, and we're selfish, and we treat each other badly. So oftentimes that commitment doesn't quite make it. Because our nature isn't quite what God's nature is. God's nature is unchanging. God's nature is love. So we can fully rely on God's love. Verse 18 goes on to tell us there is no fear in love, but perfect love, God's love, drives out fear. This is a love we can be confident in. We don't have to worry about this love. We can rely on it. And we're going to come back a little bit in just a few moments to that confidence we have. But as we think about this present status, there are also some words of caution in these verses and hear me carefully as I speak to this. Firstly, in verse four, sorry, chapter 4, verse 8, we read, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So like I mentioned at the start, we've made the phrase God is love controversial, okay? which is ridiculous, but that's what it is. And sometimes when we talk about God's love, we're quick to add, oh, but don't forget his wrath. Okay, we, want to be, we always want to be super careful about that. We're so worried about being soft on the nature of sin that we feel like we need to remind ourselves, oh, don't, don't forget about the wrath. And I worry that sometimes that takes us too far in the wrong direction. Now, don't hear me wrong, okay? God's love is so incredibly wonderful and gracious because it's in the context of God's wrath. And therefore, it affects his forgiveness and atonement and his sacrifice for us. But here we're told plainly, whoever does not love does not know God. Okay? People like to put qualifiers on it, don't they? Do they, do they deserve our love? Do, do they love us back? Do they think the right way? Are they acting the right way? Are they, are they one of us? Should we really love them? I don't read any of those qualifiers in God's word. Please, if you find them, come and show me. Remember, love doesn't mean that we approve of everything, that we join in with, that we align with everything. Whatever the world might point us toward and tell us that love has to mean. But it also doesn't come with requirements. There's no until this happens or until they say this or unless they believe this. When I look at the way God demonstrates love, it looks sacrificial. It looks like, it looks like me giving up of my ideals, of my preferences, of my comfort, maybe even my reputation. Not God's, but mine. The woman at the well and the cheating tax collector were unlikely friends of Jesus, weren't they? The leper wasn't a likely point of physical connection for him. And yet, Jesus showed unconditional love. Whoever does not love does not know God. It's a firm challenge to us. Where are our attitudes towards loving in the image of how God loves because our capacity to love is part of our image bearing. The second caution is this, chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect, fear drive, perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now hear this clearly. If you have fear in your life, if you have doubts in your life, that does not mean that you don't know God. What it means is that God is still doing a work and has a work to do in your life. It's making clear that if you have fear, he is the one to run to. He's the one to take your fear to. Take it to his perfect love, which drives out fear. 
Because one day when Jesus comes back, every tear will be washed away. When perfect love comes back, we will be bound to him for eternity and there will be fear no more. So our present status is one of being a child of the Father, a child of God, a beloved son or daughter of a perfectly loving Father who we can rely on, who wants to give us good things, who lavishes his love upon us. We carry the name and status of children of God. So we walk in this truth boldly with confidence. So, to our future hope. In chapter 4, verse 9, we read this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. If you believe and understand everything about the Christian faith, but miss this as the vital core, the cornerstone of everything, then you may as well forget it all. Now, many of you will know that I'm a Spurs supporter, okay? It's a difficult life. It's a cross I have to bear. It's just the way things are. Last week, Spurs played our biggest rivals, Arsenal, okay? And then during the week, we played our second biggest rivals, Chelsea. And you know what? We walloped them on possession. We stuffed them on field tilt, field tilt, whatever that is. We had more shots, more corners, more tackles. We even beat them on expected goals. But we lost both games. Because the only thing that matters is goals. Without goals, you lose games. Without Jesus' death for our sins, we lose eternity. As they say, that's the ball game. That's the bit that really matters. This is how God showed his love. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's pretty much the same sentence twice. It's that important. This is the gospel, the life-saving good news of the Bible. This is our hope. This is our confidence at judgment. We know and rely on the love God has for us. The love, the love is that Jesus has died for our sins. Our great hope is that we're saved. We're secure in him. He's rescued us. It is done. God loved us so much that he did it for us. And now this, this is enough. This is plenty. It's more than enough. We've done nothing to deserve this. We deserve the opposite. But God has lavished his love upon us. It's more than we deserve, and yet there's more. In chapter 3, verse 2, we read, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what, he ha what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll come to the now bit in a few moments, but for, for just a moment now, let's focus on the we shall be bit. Paul famously says in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is doing a good work in us. That good work is transforming us to be more and more like him. He's bringing our image bearing into fullness, sanctifying us, making us holy, setting us apart for his purposes and for his glory. And Paul tells us, just as John tells us, that this work will have a perfect completion. There's no half-baked jobs in God's kingdom. Christ is in the business of making all things new. And that includes us. Our future hope is that we're secure in our hope for eternity through him. And he is making us worthy of it. And there's one more element of hope that we want us to talk about that we have to look forward to here. 
All this talk of being the children of God reminds us that alongside saving us, offering this confidence of our future, preparing us for it, God has also adopted us into his family. He has made us his. It's worth remembering that adoption is a choice made by the parents. This adoption is a choice made by God. He has chosen to adopt you. And when you're adopted, you go from having no rights in the family to having all the privileges of the children in that family. And in, in many cases in adoption, there might be something, maybe there's something attractive about the child, something that draws you to, to adopt that child. Or maybe there's a relationship there, you know, maybe there's some family that you know or some reason why you think, oh, they desperately deserve for me to adopt them. But in our case, in God's eyes, there was nothing attractive or in any way deserving about us to draw out that love from God. But he chooses to anyway. Because God is love. And, God, and love gives. Love is sacrificial. In Deuteronomy 7, way back in the Old Testament, we read the following. It was spoken to the Israelites at the time, but it's just as relevant to us as God's people now. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath, he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. We are beloved, adopted sons and daughters of the Most High, and therefore we look forward to a great inheritance that comes from bearing his name. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 tells us, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What a glorious inheritance we have as co-heirs with Christ, the saviour of the world far more than we needed, far more than we deserved. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. J.I. Packer puts, it, puts all of this wonderfully in his book, Knowing God, where he writes, to be right with God is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. How wonderful is that? Okay, we come to our final point. Let's think now about how we relate to all of this. What is our current reality and responsibility? When talking about becoming like God a few minutes ago, I said we'd come back to the now part, okay? And sometimes we talk about the now but not yet of God's kingdom. Okay, it's an effort to describe the fact that because of Jesus, okay, we walk in the assurance of God's saving hope, that we get to see glimpses of his coming kingdom and all its goodness and wonder and splendor now, but we also still live in this broken world, okay? And Jesus has not yet come to make all things new. In short, the world's a mess. It's still a mess, and we are pretty poor images of God at this point, but the victory has been secured and therefore, there are specks of goodness to see and godness to see in this world and in us. As chapter 3, verse 2 says, We are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. So the long and short of it is that we're, we're not there yet. The reality is that we are not yet like God. I'm looking out at you all, and I know quite a lot of you, you're not like God yet. Neither am I. We're a bit of a mess, aren't we? And this world is a big mess. So we need to expect that. We need to navigate that, okay? And as a bit of a side note, that includes in the church. As individuals, including leaders, as a body as well, 
we will get things wrong. We will mess up with each other. A huge part of being this family of God is navigating that, which means learning a thing or two about forgiveness along the way. Think of this body, this family, as a great training ground. So there are two points to consider here about our reality, and they both might require a little bit of sacrifice on our point, on our part. There's a little bit of responsibility for us to take up. Firstly, we read in chapter 3, verse 3, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And I hear you say, Dan, you just said we aren't pure yet. We're not like God yet. So how does this work? Well, the point is that we don't just wait around for Jesus to come back to make us pure. There's a job to get on with here. David Jackman, who was director for Cornhill Theological Training, puts it well in his little commentary on John's letters. He says, if all our future expectation is centered on Christ, then we shall want to be as much like him as we can be now. If heaven is the destination, we must be traveling the road that leads there. So let's be clear, we're not talking about earning our way. We're not earning our route to heaven. We're talking about experiencing more and more of the life that God has designed us for, knowing more and more of the holiness of God. So how do we do this purifying? In John's gospel, Jesus told the disciples, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Later in 2 Timothy 3, the apostle tells us, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This incredible word of God that we have that's been left with us is powerful. Okay, it's transformative. So we use it. We throw ourselves into it. We try our best to understand it and to apply it to our lives And we just plain trust the Holy Spirit to work in power through it. I'm going to keep going on about this, okay? I'm going to do everybody's head in about this. Because we're determined in this church to raise the level of Bible engagement so that we keep being transformed by God through his word. I was doing some hospital visiting this week. And when we visit folk in hospital, we we normally share a little bit of God's word with them. And don't get me wrong, it's in, in large part to encourage them. It's encouragement for those who may be really struggling. But more than anything, we open God's word because we truly believe in its power. We believe it has the power to heal. We believe it has the power to transform We believe it has the power to bring people to know God. Nothing else has that power. And we believe it has the power to sanctify us, to purify us, to make us more like him. It's really good to read God's word, but not so that we appease the big man in the sky. We read God's word, we get stuck into God's word, we live in God's word because it's really, really good for us. So we have this responsibility to purify ourselves. We also have the responsibility to love one another. In chapter 3, verse 16, we read, this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, I very much doubt that any or many of us, at least, will have to physically die for one of the other of us. I very much doubt any of us would be willing to. But what about putting up with something you don't really like because it's helpful to a brother? What about being a bit uncomfortable personally for the benefit of a sister? Or even worse, what about being a wee bit bored sometimes for the benefit of all? What about forgiving a fellow sinning sibling when they get it wrong again? turning the other cheek when their brokenness causes you harm. 
There's a few of those that I don't do very well. I don't expect many of us to. But they don't go halfway to what Jesus did for us. Chapter 4, verse 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. True love reveals itself in sacrifice. It serves, seeks only to serve the other, regardless of the effect on ourselves. Jackman goes on in his commentary to say, if he, Jesus, learned obedience from what he suffered, as we read in Hebrews 5 verse 8, should we not give ourselves to a similar daily discipline? So daily disciplined obedience. Committing to his word and to loving one another is a great place to start. So our current reality is that we are not there yet. We live in this now but not yet. And our responsibility is to seek God's word to purify ourselves in anticipation for Jesus' return and to love like there were no cost. This is a challenge, but we do it all under the banner of the Father's love, a Father's love that we can rely on. I'm going to wrap up now if the band want to come back up. We've been jumping around a bit, but I hope what I believe God is saying to us through these verses has been clear, and that this message of God's love is reassuring to us amidst the few challenges. Our present status is as beloved child of God. If you take nothing else away, surely you take away, you are loved by God. Our Father has lavished his love upon us, and he is reliable, unchanging, in nature, love itself. And our future hope is secure in him. He has won the victory. Death has been defeated for you and for me. It's our great confidence that we can have. Rest assured in this knowledge of your future, your future in Christ, the knowledge that he is making you like him and he will carry on that good work to completion. And right now, we have this current reality we live on. We aren't there yet, okay? So view this world, view your church family and your relationships accordingly, trusting in the power of God's word in the strength of the Holy Spirit to transform us, to purify us, to sanctify us little by little every day, choosing to love one another as we go, to sacrifice for one another, accepting that we live in this meantime, okay? We live in the meantime, the now, but not yet. So we forgive each other, knowing that we're all working to look more and more like Jesus. And one day, when we look at each other, all we will see is Jesus. I'm very aware that I've been speaking to the family today, okay? Those who have come to know Jesus already, who, who know Jesus as their Lord and Father. If that's not you, then I hope what you've heard has been an encouragement, has sparked some hope in you, a desire for something better. We've spent a lot of time um, in our house over the past few years reading the Jesus Storybook Bible with our kids. Other parents will probably know it well. It repeats this little, this beautiful little description of God's love that's been kind of going around my head this week. It calls it God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. If you're here this morning and you do not yet know that love, but you know that that's what you need. And you can sense God calling you. Please come to him. Come speak to me or Stuart during worship or, or afterwards, come for prayer ministry. Don't leave it. Don't sit knowing that that hope is there for you and, and leave it alone. Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, died for our sins, for my sins and for your sins. He's made a way for us to live in and eventually experience and look forward to the fullness of this love. We need only repent and believe. Our Father's love is never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever. If he's calling you to come to him, then come. 
Accept what he's done for you. Step into the Father's love. Because we can all rest assured in his love. It is reliable. And it is good. Come and know and be assured by that love of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us. You have lavished, lavished your love upon us. Help us to know and experience that. And God, if we do not yet know that, God, I pray that you would open our hearts to it. God, as we worship now and as we go from this place, Lord, if we have fear, if we are worried, if we have doubt, Rest your peace upon us. Help us to rest assured knowing that we have this great hope. We have this confidence. We know you're making all things new. You're doing a work that you will take to completion. So help us to rest assured in your love, knowing that you are the good father that we could only dream of. Help us to know you more and more every day. Amen.